Well, good morning, and uh, again, welcome to Cross Community Church. We are in a series that we just titled Welcome Home. Now, somebody asked me last week, like, hey, what a real good plan to call a series Welcome Home and then tell people not to come. So I apologize for last week. I hope you were able to watch online and uh, enjoy from there. Uh, from this point forward, we're just going to continue to meet, so do our best not to cancel services, and in particular, uh, not cancel services last minute. So if, if you were the person that showed up and there was a sign on the door. Sorry about that, right? We still uh, want to say welcome home to you. Now, in this series, we've been talking about who we are as a church, uh, in particular, how, who God has called us to be, and really the things that we're about. So in week one, we said we are the church of Jesus Christ. So he is our head and we are the body. Now, what we know is that if the body isn't doing what the head is telling it's supposed to, there are real problems there, right? Like you, we, need, we need to do some work, figure out what's going wrong. And so we as the body of Jesus Christ ought to be doing as Jesus Christ would want us to do. We, as a matter of fact, we ought to be doing as the body of Jesus Christ, physically present now, we ought to be living our lives much like Jesus lived his life when he was here. And so we said, he's the head, we are the body. And because he is our leader, we're going to be grounded in the word and guided by his Holy Spirit. If you want to know why we do the things that we do, how we're going to operate here, I would just say, look into the Word of God. As a matter of fact, if you find something that we do here that doesn't line up with the Scriptures, we want to hear about it because we're really serious about uh, being true to the Scriptures, following the Word of God, being uh, guided ultimately by the Holy Spirit of God. Now, last week we talked about the motivation behind all that we do. We are the church, right? Well, I mean, we, he's the head, we're the body, guided by the, or grounded in the Word, guided by the Spirit. But our motivation for all that we do is love. Paul said, like, we get up here and we, we sing beautifully, we preach well, we do all the things that we do really, really well here. But if we have not love, we have nothing. We speak in the tongue of men and of angels. If we give our bodies to be burned in the flames, but we have not love, we have nothing. Nothing. And so just to be really, really clear about what we are going to be about as the church of Jesus Christ, what we want to be known for is not for having good preaching and great worship and cool facility or any of those things. We want to be known by our love. Jesus says that's how the world is going to know that you're my disciples, by the way that you love one another. So we're the church. He's our head. We're the body. And we are motivated by love in all that we do. Now today, I want to talk to you about our mission. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ in this building, watching online today, uh, the truth about you is that at some point you came to recognize your utter sinfulness before God. I mean, I, I, I've told my story here uh, many times about uh, who I was, things that I endured in my, my childhood, the broken person that I am. And, and, and what Jesus Christ did was he saw me in all of that brokenness and all the ugliness and all the sin and the, the pain. Jesus saw it and he died for me. And your story, the details are a little bit different, I'm sure, uh, but it's the same. That Jesus found you right where you are and he went to the cross on your behalf. God sent his son Jesus into this world to live a perfect, sinless life, to go to the cross and to die for you. Now, I don't know the details of your story. But you have one. And there's a sin, there's a struggle, there's a thing that you're likely here that you're ashamed of today. I want to say this to you. Everyone you've seen on TV, the, the, I mean, the, the things, the brokenness that you've seen displayed in the news, the people you've been reading about, Jesus died for them. The, the tragedies that we see around our world, Jesus died for us all. His blood was sufficient to cover all of our sin. It was sufficient to cover your sin as well. So here we are. We are a church that is gathered together under the banner of the cross of Jesus Christ, the gospel, by what he has done for us. Jesus went to the cross. He spent three days in the grave, and then he arose. And just before he ascended into heaven, he gathers his disciples together. Hey, guys, come in. We need, we need to talk. And he makes this pronouncement. He says, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. What he's about to tell his disciples is of the utmost importance. Now, uh, my kids, I don't know if this happens in, in your household, they try to boss each other around, and it does not work. Not, uh, not even a little bit, like it doesn't matter, oldest to youngest, or anywhere in between. Like, my kids are not going to listen to each other. But there are these rare moments where 
I tell one of my kids to go tell their brother or their sister to do something. So now it's not coming on their own authority, right? But it's coming on the authority of dad, which means it carries greater weight, right? So Jesus is saying, man, I'm not coming on the authority of a man. I'm not coming on the authority of any. I'm coming on all authority in all of the heavens and all of the earth. What I'm about to say to you is so profound. Like, I want you to get this. He says, I want you to go. And I want you to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. We go under God's authority. He is the one who has commissioned us to go. And he says that he's going to go with us. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. We go under his authority and in his power to make disciples of all the nations. You've heard us say many, many times here, our mission is to lead all people to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. We get this directly from Matthew 28. It's just a rephrasing for us, an easier way to say the Great Commission. It encapsulates what we want to see happen in the body here, what we believe Jesus Christ would want to happen among this body. Now, as we begin today, I want to I share with you a few things that our church is not going to be about, okay? The things that we're just not all that concerned with. Now, everything I'm going to say in this list is actually a good thing right? Uh, unless it gets put in front of the mission, okay? So we are not about drawing huge crowds here. That's not what we're about. I mean, if you want an entertainer, you need to find somebody better than me, right? We got some pretty good musicians, but the preaching is just not going to do it here. Our mission is not just to gather a whole bunch of people into a room and like, man, it was, uh, the atmosphere, the energy in the room was so great. That, that's not what we're going to be about. Now, let me just shoot straight. On the day of Pentecost, there were 3,000 people added to their number, which means 3,000 people placed their faith and trust in Jesus, left their old lives behind, and began to follow him, and they celebrated. They counted the people. They knew how many there were. They celebrated that together, like, look what God is doing in our midst. And should God decide to send us great crowds of people, we're going to praise him, and we're going to be thankful. We have nothing against crowds, but the crowds, gathering a crowd is not the goal early church, they would gather in Solomon's colonnade. It ran along the edge of the temple there in Jerusalem. It was beautiful. It was ornate, far beyond anything that we have here. Listen, the second thing we're not going to be all about is just a building a nice building here. Um, this was a basketball gym built in 1990, okay? We're, we're, not, we're not Solomon's colonnade. We have nothing against nice buildings, but that's not the goal. Like Our goal is not just to build up a really ornate place to worship. Again, nothing wrong with that. But that's not our goal. So it's not bodies, and it's not buildings. And our goal here is not to have a big budget. Now, honestly, to do the work. When you, you hear Jesus say, I want you to go and make disciples of all nations, just to get there is going to cost us some money. And we do. We spend some money sending missionaries, investing into mission agencies. We spend money on children's ministry. Like, we care. We, we know that if we're going to do the work that Jesus has called us to, it's going to take some money. But we're not going to worship at the altar of money. It's not our mission. Jesus laid it out very simply for us. Our mission is to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 and 36, they say this. It says, as Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, proclaiming the gospel, he was teaching and healing the sick. Um, the scriptures tell us that seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus, he, he's traveling around, he's doing his ministry, proclaiming the, proclaiming the gospel. And, and this is kind of like a unique view that we get where he's not talking about any one village or any one specific occasion. This was the heart of Jesus wherever he went, traveling through cities and villages. And he saw the people and he had compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Listen, if we ever lose this, it's really easy for us to start caring about bodies. It's really easy for us to start caring about buildings. It's really easy for us to start getting focused on budgets. If we lose the heart of compassion for the people, the reason why we're in this, the reason why Jesus came, if we lose our heart of love for our fellow mankind, we might as well just pack up and go home. 
Look at these words, distressed and dispirited. Now, I've literally never told someone in my life, like, hey, I'm kind of dispirited. So you may not get exactly what Jesus was feeling in this moment. I want to uh, share with you a little bit about these words. As he says, he saw them distressed and dispirited. You might have harassed and helpless in your translation. The, the word here for distressed, um, it's from a root word which means to, be, to mangle. Like uh, if you've ever seen like maybe a really bad car accident and you see the vehicle afterward and you think, oh God, I, I pray that you protected those people. Like you've seen just this mess of a vehicle. Jesus is saying, when I traveled through the villages and the cities, what I saw was people who were being destroyed by their sin and by our enemy. Like it was broken and Jesus' heart was moved with compassion. The word helpless here, it means not, not just like, oh, I can't help myself. It means they've literally been thrust down to the ground. They're on their faces and they can't get up. Jesus, when he saw the people, he saw them distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. And in the midst of that world, Jesus steps up and said, hey, I'm the way and I'm the truth and I'm the light. And come and follow me. I want to show you the way forward. I want to lead you out of this sin and brokenness that you're living in. And church, that has to be our heart too. We don't have love. We're motivated by numbers. We're motivated by dollars. We're motivated by how we appear to people or how beautiful our facility is. We're wasting our time. If we have not love, we have not anything. Jesus in John chapter 10, verses 10 through 13, he says, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. And then he talks about who he is, his heart. He said, I am the good shepherd. Now, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand, y'all probably all experienced this in your life. If you've ever hired anyone to do anything, they probably didn't care quite as much about it as you did. So he says, he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who's not the owner of the sheep, he sees the wolf coming and he leaves the sheep and he flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I pray to God that we never take on the role of the hired hand. That, that we, as we exist as the church of Jesus Christ, he's the head and we're the body. It is my heart and my, my prayer that we never fall into this place of just being hired hands where we're just kind of going through the motions, playing church, calling ourselves Christian like we wear the label. We're out there kind of going through the stuff, but our hearts aren't really engaged. We fail to see that people are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. We're no longer motivated by love. We're just going through the motions. Then maybe we didn't even act like one of those hired hands. That rather than being like the Good Samaritan and going to the person who is in need, getting our hands dirty, working on their behalf, we might instead move to the other side of the street. We might be like the hired hand who abandons the sheep when things get dangerous. We're the church of Jesus Christ. We're the hope of the world. If he's the head and we're the body, he's a good shepherd. If he laid down his life for the sheep, you know what we should do? Give up our lives for one another as well. Give up our lives for our neighbors as well. Offer ourselves in service to them in the same way that Jesus did. There are two components of discipleship that I want to talk to you about today. We've been called to make disciples, and it's important that we kind of know what we're talking about here. Uh, I, I want to be very clear. Uh, you're probably making disciples in everything you do at any point in any day. Like you're teaching, you're modeling, you're giving an example, you're discipling someone to something at every moment of every day. But when Jesus tells us to make disciples, I want to talk specifically about what we want to disciple people to. So the first part here is what does he mean by baptizing, right? So Jesus is not advocating like infant baptism or forced baptism here, right? Uh, I spent time in, in Oxford, England with my seminary. And in the middle of the city, there is this huge monument. It's known as the Martyr's Memorial, uh, where men and women began to read the Bible. And they, they began to realize that, that what the Bible taught was that we would repent and be baptized. So repentance means you come to an understanding that you are a sinner and that you need a Savior. You turn from your sins and toward Jesus Christ, right? And so uh, men and women began to read their Bibles. They were known as the Anabaptists uh, in those early days. And the Church of England, the Anglican Church at that point, um, because they decided, I need to be rebaptized after conversion, because then they were baptizing infants. They said, no, 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 I've repented, and now I need to be baptized. The Church of England would take those men and women out. 
who held to a biblical view of baptism, a biblical view of, of faith first and then baptism, and they would hold them under water until they drown. Men and women gave their lives for the words of Scripture to hold to a biblical view of baptism. The martyr's memorial there, uh, memorializing people who were martyred for their faith because they wanted to hold to the Scriptures. What we are not teaching here is that we just need to go out and baptize people. Go dunk a bunch of people. That's not what Jesus intended at all. As a matter of fact, what, what Jesus intended was that we would first lead men and women to faith, right? So baptism, what we're doing is identifying with Jesus, with Jesus in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That's what we're doing in baptizing. The water doesn't wash your sins away. Jesus did that on the cross, right? Water doesn't wash you clean. We're merely identifying ourselves. We're saying outwardly what's happened inwardly. I am a believer in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus says, hey, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We got to do that earlier today, identifying in the Father, Son, and the Spirit. I belong to him. He's my Savior. He is my Lord. Now, Romans 10, 17 tells us, maybe brings a little more clarity to what our work should be as the church in making disciples. When we talk about baptism, we believe that faith has to come first. Now, here's what Paul says in Romans chapter 10. He says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. Paul's going to go on a, a little bit there in chapter 10. He says, How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him whom they haven't heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Here's how this is supposed to work. Jesus says, As you're going, all authority in heaven are given to me. As you go, Christian, as you go, church member, as you go, believer out there, um, you should be actively sharing your faith. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we ought to be busy speaking the gospel, sharing the gospel to those around us. Can I take you, ask you just to take one second? I want you to think about someone in your life that doesn't know Jesus Christ, has never come to faith in him. Maybe you think they're the lost cause, like there's no way they're ever going to come to faith. Maybe the person that you're angry at that sinned against you, and maybe they're that family member or friend that you know, maybe you've been praying for them for a while. And just speak these words over you. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And Paul would ask us again, how are they going to hear without a preacher? How are they going to hear the gospel? How are they going to hear and come to faith unless somebody tells them? And Jesus was like, hey, you got to be busy in, in sharing your faith. What ought to be normal for us? Every single person who takes the name of Jesus as their Lord, we ought to be like Jesus was doing as he went through the cities and villages proclaiming the gospel, talking about what Jesus Christ has done for us. That ought to be the normal part of our lives as believers in Jesus. Speaking the gospel, people need to hear it. I was struck just a couple of weeks ago, uh, I had a, a conference call. You know, you can like do a three-way call with a couple of my friends. They don't live around here anymore. And I remember hanging up the phone and just being in awe of the conversations that I had because they were my friends in high school and those conversations were radically different back then. We're talking about being a godly husband, about pursuing Jesus Christ. And I, I, to be honest with you, in particular, one of these friends, I cannot believe that he's following Jesus. And do you know what made the difference in their life? Somebody shared the gospel. Somebody took the time to articulate to them. Unfortunately, it wasn't me. I, I mean, I, I tried to share with it for sure, but it, it wasn't me. But somebody did, and faith came because they heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, and their lives and their families have been forever changed as a result. So your person that's in your mind today, I want to challenge you to continue praying to be faithful in sharing the gospel. Jesus, in commissioning the church, his disciples, calling on all the authority he has, says, I want you to go and make disciples. Baptizing is the beginning. Now, here's what's happened in the church over the years. We've called on people to pray a prayer and walk an aisle, and then we've basically left them here praying, right? We've kind of said, okay, now you're in, like, right? You, you crossed the finish line, in a sense, is what we've said. But the reality of it is, baptism is not the finish line. It's the first step in the race that God has called us to run. It's the first step of obedience that we take. And so discipleship uh, encompasses far more than just sharing the gospel, 
It goes on. Uh, Jesus says, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey. Most of us think about teaching in the sense of what I got like when I went to college at Oklahoma State. Uh, I remember uh, my freshman year uh, having one single classroom uh, that had more students in it gathered to listen to our professor than were in my entire high school, right? I'm looking around like, oh my goodness, like this is a pretty giant class. And there was one professor, he had a clicker and a PowerPoint presentation, and we all sat there while he instructed us. Now, many of us, when we hear Jesus say, teach them, we're like, oh yeah, we need some classes, man. We'll gather people in. We'll fill their heads full of knowledge, and that's going to just change everything for them. But when Jesus says teaching them to obey, when he calls on us to disciple people, he had a different understanding of what it meant to teach altogether. You can see this lived out in Jesus' life. He didn't like, just like teach lectures and all that. Now, certainly, he taught through parables. He preached sermons. But he also invited men and women to follow him. And as he went along the way, Jesus would be with his disciples, and he'd sneak off to pray. Hey, Jesus, what are you, what are you doing there? Like, you, you go off to pray. Could you teach us to do that? Well, yeah, let me teach you to pray. And we get the Lord's Prayer. Jesus, he's healing the sick, and he's casting out demons. He's proclaiming the gospel. And, and the disciples are like, hey, Jesus, what are you doing there? He's like, yeah, I'll tell you what. I want to send you guys out two by two. I want you to cast out unclean spirits. I want you to heal the sick. I want you to start doing these things. He was teaching them to obey, to walk as he walked, to live as he lived. As a matter of fact, the word for disciple is the Greek word mathetes. It comes from the root manthano. You don't care about that, but it's true, right? So the, the root word, monthano, and here's what that means. Monthano means to learn by use and practice. To, to become or to be in the habit of doing something. Like, hey, this is how you learn. You actually practice these things. You, these become habitual for you. It is thought accompanied by action. And so Jesus, he would call on people. like He would point them toward the truth, and he would call on them to be faithful. Even giving us the, the, the parable, right? The wise man built his house on the rock. The one who hears my words and puts them into practice, that's the guy that's building his life on the rock. The people who hear them, who take a classroom view of learning, they just kind of absorb all of this theological and biblical knowledge but never actually live it, and they're building their life on the sand. And it's going to come crashing down around them. As Jesus has called us to make disciples, it's to teach them how to obey. Uh, one of my buddies, we graduate college, and this is supposed to be a really big moment in your life. Uh, in college, I ate more sandwiches. Like, I still don't really love sandwiches to this day because I got so tired of them. And so we graduate college, and one of my friends calls me uh, one day. It's like a big moment. We're finally getting paid a little bit, you know, making some money. And he calls me and said, hey, uh, man, I don't think I'm going to make it. What do you mean? Like, your life's just taking off, you know? Like, you're making some cash. Like, things should be really rolling for you. He's like, man, I'm not going to make it. Um, he had a degree in marketing. He said, a, a company had hired him. He said, they want me to, like, it's not just like, they won't tell me, like, what to do. He said, they want me to market their company. It's like, well, I mean, you do have a degree in marketing. Like, you should do that. And he was like, man, I can, I can read the studies. I know this, but I don't really know how to market a company. You know, I'm afraid that the same would tr be true for many of us who, who grew up in church. For, for many of, uh, of the people that we would say we're discipling, you know, they know a lot about the Bible. They've heard the sermons. They've listened to the lectures. But they've never been taught how to obey, how to implement their faith, what it looks like to, to be in the habit of being a disciple. It's like constant on-the-job training where we're following after Jesus and, and, and learning. Hey, this is how I'm supposed to be living as someone who has said, I died to the person that I once was. I'm now following Jesus. I found new life in him. Discipleship doesn't happen in the classroom. It happens life on life. Jesus showed them. He told them as he went along the way. So think about disciple. It's like becoming a lifelong learner. One of the things we say around here is that we bet the farm on community. When it comes to making disciples, we bet the farm on community. Like, 
The thing that we ask every single one of our members to do is to walk in community with other believers. You know, Jesus, he's not walking here in flesh anymore. But instead, he's given his spirit to live within everyone who has called upon his name. He's come to faith in him. And what we ask people to do is to walk in community with other believers. Because I promise you, if it hasn't happened yet, there will be times where you don't know how to pray anymore. And you don't know what step you're supposed to take. You don't know what was about to come or how to handle what you've already been given. And you need people to walk alongside of you. To say, hey, here's the way walk in it. Let me remind you of what the Word says in this moment. I've had people sit in my office suffering great losses and say, I don't know how to pray. And what a joy it was to be able to say, you don't have to. I'm going to pray for you right now. I'm going to pray on your behalf. People that say, I don't know how I'm going to make it. And we can say, I don't either, but we're going to do it together. When we call on men and women to walk in community with one another, we're asking them to practice what Jesus commands us to do in the New Testament. There are 40 different places where Jesus taught us how we're supposed to interact and live with one another. Spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Admonish one another. I don't know if you know this about yourself, but you blow it sometimes. And what's worse is sometimes you blow it and don't even realize it. And how sad would it be if you didn't have someone to call that to your attention? So we love one another. We bear with one another. If you've been in a community group here very long, I'm I'm just going to say this, you've probably been frustrated. Doing life with other people, walking through life together, it can be frustrating. Because sometimes no one else brings any daggum food and you're all hungry. And like, I'm having to carry all the load and they don't help clean up like they're supposed to. And they're not carrying, they're not showing up. They're not carrying their weight in our group. And in the midst of that, Jesus is like, oh yeah, welcome to discipleship. This is not about you. Instead, this is about you learning how to walk as a disciple. Serve them, love them, bear with them over the long haul. Like, have the conversations with them. Teach them how to obey. My kids and I have been watching this show. Uh, it came out on Netflix. It's been around forever. We just didn't have cable. Uh, it's called Alone. And uh, the premise of the show, you have 10 people who are sent out into brutal wilderness with almost no supplies. And whoever lasts the longest, whoever can survive the longest, gets $500,000. And I don't know if you've seen the show, but man, there are some impressive people on there like I mean, I don't like to admit this, but more rugged than I am, right? They can endure some things that I can't endure. They can do, they know all about medicinal herbs and like edible plants, and I know none of that stuff. You know, I can kind of like get around in southeast Oklahoma, but not where they are. So they make these ridiculous shelters that I'm like, my goodness, they're talented. And they have all, one guy made a canoe. Like with no tools. Like, I mean, he made a canoe and they're fishing and surviving, doing all these amazing things. And these rugged people, they got like, they have no food and they, they have frigid temperatures and somehow they survive. But you know what is just striking to me about that show? These rugged men and women, women, guy, I'm telling you, they're amazing on this show, right? These rugged men and women who survive all the elements and the difficulties of being exposed. They don't have proper clothing or food or shelter. Like, they just make it all. What blows my mind is to watch those people who stood up against all of those harsh elements. They break down and they quit the show because they can't take being alone. You and I were made to live in community with one another You weren't made to go through life alone. Discipleship was never meant to happen alone. Sometimes the disciples, they would be with Jesus. They'd be arguing, thinking maybe Jesus couldn't hear them. Hey, I want to sit on the right hand. I want to sit on the left hand. Peter's boasting, I'd never deny Jesus. And Jesus had to step in and he'd have to rebuke them. He'd have to teach them. He'd have to show them that he was indeed the way and the truth and the life. How sad would it be? If we met here for another 10 or 20 or 30 years, we just gathered in this place, praising the way, the truth, and the life, but we didn't show other people how to follow him. That we had people who were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd in our city, in our neighborhood, maybe even our home, our friend group. We're like, yeah, yeah, no big deal. I'm like a hired hand. I'm not going to get my hands dirty. I'm not going to put myself out there. I'm just going to show up to church on a Sunday. 
The mission of our church is to lead all people to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ because we believe that is the mission that Jesus has called us to. That's what we're going to give our lives to. In Luke 9, 23, Jesus said, If any man would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, in in modern culture, the cross is kind of like this neat thing, like you put crosses on your wall, and it kind of makes you think of Jesus and good thoughts. But in the time that Jesus would have uttered these words, the cross was a brutal instrument of death and of torture. And when Jesus was inviting men to, it wasn't just walk an aisle and pray a prayer, it was to pick up your cross People understood very clearly that if we were going to be disciples of Jesus, we were going to follow after him, that meant a cross. That meant denying ourselves, our desires, our wants, dying to who we once were to now follow Jesus and offering his life for other people, that we might do the same. If any man would come after me, deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Can I ask you another question today? What does your faith cost you? What are you denying yourself on behalf of Jesus Christ? In order to follow him, what have you left behind? What have you given up to say, no, 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 I'm I'm not going to go the way I wanted to go. I'm not going to live life the way I thought I was going to live life. I'm going to follow after Jesus. And so those things have to go. I've got to give up my desires, my stuff, and I'm going to chase after Jesus. I'm going to do it his way. He's the way and the truth and the life, and I'm following him. Has your faith cost you anything? As the church of Jesus Christ, it ought to be normal for us to give things up. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this. He says, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. We don't want to just teach people the commands of Jesus. We want to teach them how to obey. We want to teach them those habits that they're supposed to bring into their lives that would characterize discipleship and following after him. Here at Cross Community, we've asked all of our members to um, take on the six practices of a disciple. Now, to be really clear, some people are like, hey, that's super legalistic that you'd ask people to do six things. And listen, if our motivation isn't love for God and love for other people, these things can be legalistic. If you're trying to be justified before God by doing six things or not doing six like not going to work. But if we love God and we love other people and our heart is to become a disciple who can make disciples, these six practices is about denying yourself and taking up your cross and following Jesus. It, it begins with devoting daily, those six practices. The first, devoting daily. Rather than going on your own merry way, getting the extra sleep, like making time to get coffee in the morning, we say we are going to devote ourselves to Jesus Christ every day. We get up and we open his word. What does God's word have to say about that? We offer ourselves to God in prayer, seeking after the Lord. Which way should I go? God, give me wisdom. You're the head. I'm a part of the body here. So Jesus, I'm going to devote myself to you again today, dying to the person that I was. I want to live for you today, every day, rekindling our devotion to him, denying ourselves and following him. So we say, devote daily. It costs us something, but we do it because Jesus is our prize. Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. And a man finds that treasure and he goes and sells everything that he owns in order to buy that field. And the implication is, the treasure was more than worth it. The treasure was worth everything he owned. That's the kingdom of God. So we give things up in order to take on the habits and the practices of becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. We devote ourselves daily. The next one is to gather consistently. I know this about you. It costs you something to be here. It's Father's Day. And many of you love to be celebrating with somebody, maybe men, being celebrated right now. But you're here. Walking the path of the disciple. The scriptures tell us not to forsake assembling together. And so you're here. You're walking the path of the disciple. And so we ask our church members to say, yes, I'm in. I'm going to walk the path of a disciple there. We say commit yourselves to community because you're not supposed to go through life alone. You need people in your life to encourage you and spur you on toward love and good deeds so that you don't give, get weary in doing good and give up. But instead, we want to persevere. We deny ourselves some things. You know, I have to clean my house every stinking Sunday. We got to get food together and communicate with people. And it can be a pain, but it is a joy because I'm walking the path of a disciple. 
We enter in with people. We have difficult conversations, but we do it for each other. We're taking up our cross. It's not about us. We take up our cross, and we have people in our home. And we pray with people. And we challenge people to follow after Jesus, and they do the same for us. The third thing is to serve faithfully. I once uh, was, was on a mission trip, and I heard a missionary say this. He said, don't call your, yourself a servant and then get offended or expect to not be treated like one. Don't call yourself a servant and then expect to, be, to not be treated like one. Like, for me, if I'm going to serve, I kind of want it to be celebrated. You know what I'm talking about? Like, it's like what you do if you're a husband and you sweep the kitchen. You're like, hey, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm sweeping the kitchen. You know, like you're kind of wanting to be celebrated for that. And many of us, that's the way we are in the church. Rather than saying, hey, I'm taking up my cross and I'm going to offer to the people of this body what Jesus has given to me. I'm going to serve other people in the same way that Jesus served me. Sometimes we're waiting to be celebrated. Jesus said, deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. This is the treasure hidden in the field. This is the life that's going to bear fruit in you. You're going to find abundance here. You were those who were harassed and helpless. Now come and follow me. Number six is give sacrificially. We take what's ours and we sow it into the kingdom of God. Can I ask you this question? Have you ever denied yourself? Given so much that it cost you something? That you couldn't just live however you wanted to live and do whatever you wanted to do anymore? But instead, you had to dial back your lifestyle. You had to make some adjustments. You had to deny yourself some things in order to give sacrificially. Has your faith cost you anything monetarily? Or are you just giving God your leftovers? The change in your console? Are you sowing into the kingdom of God? Are you denying yourself and taking up your cross and saying, listen, I don't need those things. I gave that life up. I'm following Jesus. I'm carrying my cross. I found something better. Are you giving sacrificially to the kingdom of God? The final thing is engaging missionally. Jesus came that men and women might have life. He came that people might not be harassed and helpless, but they might experience the joy of him, the abundant life in him. This thief, steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I came that they might have life. Men and women come to faith in Jesus Christ. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. If we've never opened our mouths to share the gospel, to speak about who Jesus is, what he's done for men and women, we probably shouldn't pretend that we're his disciples. Everywhere he went, Jesus went proclaiming the gospel. He's commissioned us to make disciples of men and women. We're not engaging missionally. We're not on mission with Jesus. The body is not responding to the leadership of the head, which is Jesus. Have you denied yourself and taken up your cross and followed him? We do believe that Jesus is, the kingdom of God is the treasure hidden in the field, the pearl of great price. To, to gain the kingdom of God, it's worth losing everything. And that's what we want to be about as a church. We're going to call on you to serve when you don't feel like serving. To give when, when it's going to hurt you to give. To share when it's going to be uncomfortable to share. We are going to call on you to seek after Jesus even when you have to say no to other things in order to say yes to that. But that's what we're here for, right? We have found the treasure hidden in the field. We found the news that everyone needs to hear. We are disciples of Jesus. We've said this about us. We're one church. We've got a couple of campuses here and in Pecola. Man, what I want to see is that we have hundreds of locations all across our city and all across our county, that your home is a place where because there's a member of Cross Community there, the gospel is there. There is someone on mission, a little Christ, as they used to call Christians, lives there. That we would be the church, one church, two campuses, with hundreds of locations across the city, bringing light into the darkness, men and women who are willing to deny themselves and take up their cross and follow him. That's who we want to be as a church. I'm going to give my life to that. And I'm going to ask you to do it too. To follow hard after Jesus. To lose your life that you might find it in him. Would you pray with me? Father, we just thank you for Jesus.
who changed everything for us, who offered his life, who laid it down that we might find ours. And God, we praise you that we have found life in you. And God, I pray that we wouldn't keep that to ourselves. May we be men and women who make disciples and teach them to obey. God, would you have your way in our church? We worship you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.